Today's lecture is our third on imaging science. Let's look at the objectives for today. After today's lecture, students will understand the nature of noise and its frequency dependence by learning about the noise power spectrum. Students will also learn about contrast in detectors and the contrast to noise ratio. We shall also learn about signal to noise ratio in detectors. Students will understand the performance of imaging detectors using the contrast detail curves for qualitative analysis and detective quantum efficiency for quantitative analysis. We shall finish up by learning about the performance of observers using receiver operating characteristic curves. In a previous lecture, we learned about the normal and Poisson distributions, and we saw how closely these distributions match for large counts as shown in this figure. Also, if you recall, we learned that X-ray and gamma-ray counting statistics obey the Poisson distribution, so in a radiology imaging setting, it is useful to approximate the Poisson distribution with a normal distribution. We can do this when we stipulate that sigma is equal to the square root of n as shown, where sigma will represent standard deviation or noise, and n is the mean number of photons or the mean signal. As an example, let's say we take a radiograph where there are n photons striking the image receptor. Using the normal distribution assumption for Poisson distribution, and now using n to represent the mean number of photons in the image, the noise per pixel sigma is given by the square root of the signal n. This is important because we can adjust the mean signal n in an image by adjusting technique parameters like kV and mas. This means we can control the noise levels perceived in an image. Relative noise in the image is equal to the coefficient of variation, COV, which is equal to sigma divided by n or standard deviation divided by mean. Let's look next at how the signal-to-noise ratio is affected by noise levels. Based on our formula that sigma is equal to the square root of n, when we adjust n, we are also adjusting sigma. This brings us to the concept of signal-to-noise ratio. This is the inverse of the coefficient of variation or relative noise in percentage value. This table shows us how the relative noise and the signal-to-noise ratio changes for different values of the photon counts. For 10 photons, your noise is 3.16, so signal-to-noise ratio is 10 divided by 3.16, which is just 3.2 approximately. Relative noise is a coefficient of variation, which is 3.16 divided by 10, or 0.316. Multiply by 100 to get 31.6%, or approximately 32% as shown in the table. Let's say we increase the signal N from 10 to 100. How will the relative noise change? At n equals 100, the noise is square root of 100 or 10. Relative noise is 10 divided by 100 or 0 0.1 times 100%, which is 10%. Now, if we compare the relative noise of 32% we obtained initially to 10%, we see that increasing the signal 10 times reduces the noise by a factor of 3.2. In the context of X ray imaging, a 10 times increase in the signal corresponds with 10 times increase in patient dose to achieve a factor of 3.2 decrease in noise. The decrease in noise is small relative to the increase in dose that produces the noise decrease. In CT imaging, for example, signal N is due to MAS used, which relates to dose, or signal can be related to slice thickness reconstructed for viewing, which relates to how many photons are allowed in each slice. A simple way to calculate relative noise in an image is to remember that relative noise in an image is inversely proportional to the square root of the signal. For example, when you double the signal by doubling, say, the MAS, the relative noise decreases by the square root of 2 or 1.414. And when you quadruple the signal, the relative noise decreases by the square root of 4 and so on. On the previous slide, we looked at the noise magnitude in an image as the standard deviation of signal. That simple noise metric is not enough to characterize image noise. It turns out that the way noise looks is just as important as the noise magnitude. The appearance of the noise is called noise texture. Let's look at the two images on this slide. The standard deviations in the highlighted boxes are identical, but the noise looks different. We can understand the differences in noise appearance by using the noise variance, which is just the squared standard deviation. 
The frequency dependence of the noise variance is characterized by the noise power spectrum. Noise power spectrum of a system describes how well the system processes noise in an image. Noise power spectrum is important in CT where different reconstruction kernels are used because each kernel either removes or preserves different frequencies of noise. So images can look different even if the noise magnitude is the same. Last week we looked at different types of noise and how they affect contrast. And we just saw on the previous slide how noise texture can also affect contrast. Let's look now at how subject contrast affects image contrast. Subject contrast depends on intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. The intrinsic component of subject contrast relates to the actual anatomical or functional changes in the patient's tissues which give rise to contrast. That is, the patient walks into the imaging center with intrinsic, physical or physiological properties that give rise to subject contrast. An example again will be rib cage in contrast to lung tissue. Extrinsic factors in subject contrast relate to how the image acquisition protocol can be optimized to enhance subject contrast. Possible protocol enhancements include changing the X-ray energy, for example, the KV, using a different radio pharmaceutical, or injecting an iodine contrast as in CT, or gadolinium contrast agents as in MR. The next type of contrast is detector contrast. When a patient is imaged with X-rays, the type of X-ray detector used is important in determining how the image will look. Different detectors have different contrast responses. On this slide, we have the relative responses of two types of detectors to an input signal. One detector shows a sigmoid curve, meaning it amplifies the signals in the steep areas of the curve and gives a linear response in that area. The other detector shows a linear response across the entire signal range. A sigmoid curve is characteristic of a screen film type detector, while a straight line response is characteristic of a digital detector. Detector contrast has a modulating effect on subject contrast and affects how the displayed image will look. Let's look next at displayed contrast. Once the image is captured, the raw image data is first processed before it is sent for physician viewing. Most medical images have bit depth ranging from 10 to 14 bits, which means they have gray scales ranging from 1024 to 16384 shades of gray. Most displays, however, are only capable of displaying 8-bit to 10-bit images. So the display computer needs to convert the higher bit depth data encoded in the image to the spectrum of gray scales on the monitor. This is where the lookup tables we learned about last week come in. The lookup table converts the digital information in the image to gray scale values. This slide shows how a lookup table displays the chest radiograph shown here by adjusting the window and level in the image. I will be talking about bit depth later, but before that, let's look next at contrast to noise ratio in an image. Contrast to noise ratio is considered a good metric for describing the signal amplitude relative to the ambient noise in an image. It does not depend on the size of the object. Because contrast to noise ratio is computed using the difference in mean values between the signal region and the background region, the object must be homogeneous. The figure and formula show the regions of interest and how contrast to noise ratios are calculated. The region of interest in the object is the signal mean, and the region of interest outside the object is the background mean. The background standard deviation or noise is in the denominator of the formula. An example of the uses of the contrast to noise ratio metric include optimizing the KV of an imaging study to maximize bone contrast at a fixed dose level, or computing the dose necessary to achieve a desired contrast to noise ratio for a given object. Signal to noise ratio is a metric similar to the contrast to noise ratio. However, unlike contrast to noise ratio, signal to noise ratio is explicitly size dependent and the size and shape of the object are part of the calculation. Also, the object itself does not need to be homogeneous, but the background must be homogeneous. The formula on this slide shows that signal to noise ratio is the difference between the mean background signal and the signal at each pixel i in the image. This is then divided by the standard deviation of the background. Signal to noise ratio is one of the most meaningful metrics that describes how well an object will be seen by the typical observer. It was shown that if the signal to noise ratio is greater than 5, 
then an object will almost always be detected. This is called the Rose Criterion. In a previous lecture, we learned about spatial resolution and contrast resolution as if they were separate entities. But both of these quantities together are important on any given image. In particular, it does not matter if the imaging detector has excellent spatial resolution, if there is too much noise in the detector and the statistical integrity of the image is not sufficient to detect a small object. We can understand the relationship between spatial and contrast resolution by using a conceptual visual method called a contrast detail diagram. A few contrast detail curves are shown on this slide. On the figures shown, greatest detail is on the left column of the curves and the greatest contrast is the top row of the curves. If you look at the top figure, as more noise is introduced from figure A to C, less detail is seen as shown by the yellow demarcation line moving to the right. The lines represent the boundaries of what is visible. The bottom figure shows how a contrast detail curve can be used to compare two images in terms of the detail and contrast viewable on each image. In figure A, both systems A and B have the same detail, but A has more contrast than B. In figure B, system B has more detail than system A, but system A has more contrast than system B. The use of the contrast detail curves on this slide represents a qualitative method of describing the relationship between the spatial resolution and contrast resolution. We will see a quantitative method next. We have here a quantitative method for analyzing spatial and contrast resolution by using the detective quantum efficiency, DQE. The detective quantum efficiency is a characterization used by imaging scientists. It describes the overall frequency dependent signal to noise ratio performance of the imaging system. It uses the input signal to noise ratio and the output signal to noise ratio to calculate the detective quantum efficiency as shown by the formula on this slide. It is considered an excellent description of the dose efficiency of an X-ray detection system. So far, we have learned about the performance of image recording and display systems that allow us to view images. Before we get into the performance of the observers viewing these images, I would like to first talk a little about human perception of visual information. This slide shows various figures. The top left shows several stages of human visual perception. So far, we have learned about the first three stages, which are exposure of the image receptor, recording of image information, and display of the image. We shall now learn about the last three stages circled in red on the top left figure. These are the detection of some object in the image, recognition of an object, and interpretation of what the image means or diagnosis. The other three figures shown on the top right and bottom are challenges related to the three stages I just mentioned. Look at the top right figure. What do you see? This first challenge is about detection. Look at the bottom left image. What do you see? This image is about recognition. In the last image on the bottom right, what do you see? How would you interpret what you see? Here is a light moment before we get into observer performance. This slide is also about interpretation. A mathematician's interpretation of shearing sheep may be different from what a sheep farmer thinks. On the previous slides, we have looked at ways to quantify image quality. But the ultimate quality of an image relates to how well it conveys diagnostic information to the interpreting physician. We can test this by using the concept of the receiver operating characteristic curve or ROC curve. The starting point of ROC analysis is a two by two decision matrix called a truth table. The truth table is shown on this slide. The two by two decision matrix defines the terms true positive, true negative, false positive and false negative. Most of the work in performing patient-based ROC studies comes down to an independent confirmation of what truth is. This may require biopsy confirmation or long-term patient follow-up or other methods to ascertain the true diagnosis. An ROC curve is a plot of the true positive fraction versus the false positive fraction as shown on the top figure. The black dot is called an operating point for a given observer for a particular task like mammography or head MRI or some other task. 
It is the sensitivity on the vertical axis plotted against one minus specificity on the horizontal axis for an observer for a given task. The area under the curve is often used as a measure of overall performance of an observer. Area under curve values run from 0.5, the dotted line indicating pure guessing, to 1, a perfect ROC curve that runs along the left and top axis bounding the entire area of the unit square. When analyzing ROC performance curves of observers, there is a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. This is demonstrated by the black dot on the ROC curve. Increasing sensitivity reduces specificity and vice versa. Another performance measure is accuracy, but accuracy is not a good measure of diagnostic performance. Accuracy depends on disease incidence. A low disease incidence will produce 100% accuracy if all cases are just called negative or normal. As an example, consider mammography where there is approximately a 3 in 1,000 breast cancer incidence in the screening population. If a radiologist just called all cases negative without looking at the images, accuracy will be approximately 99.7%. So in this case, the specificity will be 100%, but the sensitivity will be zero which means the few positive cases will not be detected. Rather than using accuracy as a measure of diagnostic performance, we can use the positive predictive value. This refers to the probability that a patient is positive and the radiologist calls it positive. On the other hand, the negative predictive value refers to the probability that the patient is negative and the radiologist calls it negative. Here are the answers to the visual perception challenge. Viewers should see a Dalmatian dog in the detection challenge, a young woman and an old woman in the recognition challenge, and the interpretation challenge is water flowing without an origin. Let's finish up with a few questions. First question. The rose criterion tells us an object in an image will always be detected if 1. The signal to noise ratio is less than 5. 2. Contrast to noise ratio is greater than 5. 3. Signal to noise ratio is greater than 5. 4. Contrast to noise ratio is less than 5. The correct answer is signal to noise ratio is greater than 5. Next question. A radiologist viewing a 1.25 mm slice CT image of an abdomen complains of too much noise in the image. Which of these approaches is the best way to reduce the noise by a factor of 2? Your choices are 1. Double the MAS. 2. Increase slice thickness from 1.25 mm to 2.5 mm. 3. Quadruple the MAS. 4. Increase slice thickness from 1.25 mm to 5 mm. The correct choice is increase slice thickness from 1.25 mm to 5 mm. Note also that quadrupling the MAS will reduce the noise by a factor of 2, but that will lead to an increase in patient dose, so that is not the best choice. Next question. Noise texture is characterized by the A. Rose criterion B. Contrast detail curve C. Detective quantum efficiency D. Noise power spectrum The correct choice is D noise power spectrum. Thank you for watching this presentation.